Hey all, Connor here from CameraStore.com, joined as usual by Nico for another round of our Q&A. So we've gathered questions from Instagram and other social medias, and we will be answering them for you. So questions about cameras, film, our store, what we do here. Um, yeah, if you have any questions that come up or you're interested in knowing about our perspective on things, leave a comment below and it might make it into the next video. So why don't we just yep. get right to it. These are from Instagram, by the way. So usually YouTube or Instagram. So AV Sheck, how do you guys decide a price value of a camera? Like how much scratches reduce price or keep the value? Well, <laughs> that's what I do at the store. Um, that's a big part of my job is choosing prices. And it is an ongoing process. Um, depends a lot on the value of it. So high value items actually issues with them tend to affect the value more, if that makes sense. So scratches on a Leica lens will result in a bigger price drop than scratches on something from Tokina or something like that. Um, we do have some base, you know, amounts that we change um, for scratches. You know, a normal lens you can expect probably 20 to 40 euros depending how bad they are. Um, other issues, yeah, we, you know, 10, 20 depending on how bad they are. Fungus is a bad one. People are, are generally scared of fungus. Um, and I think in general, we try to lower the price maybe a bit more than what might be necessary, um, just because you're buying sort of an imperfect thing. Um, so we want you to get a good deal on it, even if it won't affect use. You'll notice that, that a lot of the time we specify that the issues won't affect your use at all. Um, and that's true, we're not lying, obviously. Um, but the price will still be lower, so. Yeah, I think one thing to consider is, is the issue affecting use or are the issue not affecting use? If it's a slight scratches, which we've seen in multiple, you even have an article on the website about like scratching uh, yeah. lenses with scratches, how much do they affect use? Um, it'll be less than if it is an issue we consider might affect. So like very deep haze yeah. or like scratches on the back element are worse than scratches on the front element or sensors with dust that is under, under the glass, things like that, we will affect the price. So it does affect, there's percentages and things like that, but like Connor said, it's not the same to have a 2,000 euro Leica lens with like haze than a, you know, Tokina 70 to 210 macro lens with haze because those always usually have haze. So it's, yeah. it's related to the item and related to the damage or how usable it is for your photography. Every item used has some issue. Even brand new lenses have a little bit of dust from factory. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. like small amounts of dust is completely normal. Yeah. We'll never notice. Yeah, yeah, you're buying a used item. There is sort of this um, understanding that, that we have with our customers that used items will have some very minor faults as baseline. And so we don't report every tiny little piece of dust that's inside. Um, another thing that maybe is worth mentioning is like how taxes work sometimes. I think it can be confusing at least I, I'm an American, so when I came here, it was a whole new world of import fees and taxes that we don't really deal with so much. And most of our customers are in Europe, but lots of them aren't. So um, our process is basically we would grab a sort of baseline price for a lot of used items. That means going to eBay, going to other stores, and formulating sort of a base price. And then if a lot of them or all of those prices are normally from the U.S. or Japan, so to import those to Europe, you have to pay, depending on your country, a certain percentage of tax. So we usually add that price, um, sort of bake it in because... Um, if you're going yeah. to try to get one in the market, you yes, can have yeah. the option of our store that's fully checked and giving you the return warranty on all these things, yeah. or you're going to play you know, the buying from somewhere else, importing the hustle, like the hassle of doing that and the customs and custom fees. So we do usually go a little bit higher than what it would be without VAT, but yeah. obviously used items have a different situation with the whole VAT. Yeah. But yeah, that's how we do it. I think, like you said, you check on different stores, the mm -hmm. marketplaces, like we the other day listed a camera that almost nobody knows about. Yeah. Then it's way harder to find a base price. So you kind of have to go with your best estimated price on what you think the value of a camera like that is. And this was a Linhoff Technar that yeah. basically had no information <laughs> online about the description of it. It's not in the books about Linhoff. It's just a camera that's quite unique. There's not many in the world. So we go for our best 
educated like Linhoff cameras are kind of the high end of large format and it is a rare camera so like we priced it accordingly to that and then we put obviously the working and not working as a conditions for the ultimate pricing if it's not working as a collector's camera if it's working as a user's camera and yeah. we take it into account so it's not super simple i mean no, it, connor's, it's extremely complicated connor's <laughs> team spends days uh, arguing and we have yeah. all kinds of arguments about like this should be a little bit higher or this should be a little bit lower it's not moving like we yeah. try to get the things moving make customers be happy with their purchases but also have enough profit to continue to do it next yeah time. i mean that's the the struggle of any business you, you have to put it at the right price that it sells but not put it and if you put it too high it doesn't sell if you put it too low you could have gotten more and then yeah. your profits aren't enough okay so next question we have undressem that's how you read it that's that's literally what it says yeah, yeah. also the best camera lens safe storage technique you know i'm guess the question is more like which is the way you store camera gear safely for a yeah. period of time um I guess the main things that you want to worry about are uh, humidity, um, temperature generally. Humidity is maybe more important than temperature. Um, so something that's dry, you don't want it to be wet because that's how you get fungus. Nothing too hot or too cold really. Um, something stable, somewhere where the temperature isn't changing rapidly because that can cause issues as well. Yep. Um, I know there are some people that get their own climate controlled air sealed shelves you don't really need that if you can find a good place but if depends you can't on the country that, and the location yeah. i if think that, then that's a good solution asia and some places i know japan and some of those areas south, have, america. south america have a lot of humidity yeah. so that you go for that but it is humidity normal temperature so obviously inside a house if there's ac or some climate control you don't want to have a lot of dust around no. then there's the whole debate of like should it be cocked or uncocked and like I've heard all kinds of arguments from both sides. But yeah, from our mechanics. Yeah. I've heard different mechanics say different things about yeah. different cameras. So I, I don't think there's a universal keep it cocked, keep it uncocked. Yeah. Um, it, it probably depends on the camera, and it's probably mostly okay either way yeah. with most cameras. And just put lens caps if you have them. Just put it in a camera bag or Pelican case, something like that. And if you are going to keep it there for a while and not touch it because your winter's long, you can always get like some UV lamp and give it a little bit of UV to the lenses because mm -hmm. if there is fungus or growth That's or true. possibilities, it will kill it. Yeah. So I've heard people doing like, I'm sunbathing my lenses and they'll just like open the large format lenses like, like the shutter and just put it on the window for like a few hours in the morning. Mm. But do bear in mind temperatures and that can affect and especially it could cause a separation between the bal bal balsam that's the word yeah. um so be careful with extreme heat extreme cold yes. uh, because it, the lenses will pop in a way if you do that yeah but yeah just protect them keep them dry and keep them you know safe and if you can use them mm. yeah using them is, is probably the best storage device keeping onto them holding them and not using them is how you get stuff that it's like a car. If a car sits in the backyard for 40 years, it's probably not going to work when you yeah. go to turn it on. Yep, it's good to keep them running. Okay, we have IZBZ Org. Um, what is the best zone focusing camera and how many ISO film should we use? So best zone focusing camera and what ISO like should one use? It's a lot of really good zone focused cameras. Yeah. Um, we were talking a little bit about this before. Um, you mentioned the XA2. I think that's a great it's a one. It's a simple one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, I guess the um, Olympus Trip 35 is another one. Yeah. That is very simple to use. The LCA series from Lomography yeah. and previous to Lomography are very simple to use too. I'd say for zone focusing, a few things that are nice are first the focus throw not to be super long. Because if you are kind of moving from like one meter to three meters, you don't want to have to like everybody. We have a Leica R lens. Like yeah. It's like three twists of a hand. Yeah. Um, well, you just don't get the specificity to like be accurate with your focus when you're doing zone focus. Yeah, but it's easier to like move like a Leica M lens from one meter to three meters if yeah. you're like walking and running yeah. uh, and shooting than like if you are on an R lens that like or a Hasselblad. You have a Hasselblad. Mm. The lens on the Hasselblad. Yeah, yeah, you're forever the zone focus. It all around. Not that you would probably recommend shooting zone focus on a hot no, no. 
You know what's a great one? Uh, my my Agfa, the Agfa Optima series of point and shoots. Yep. They're zone focus, and with some of them, you get the viewfinder readout in the um in the viewfinder, or the the focus readout in the viewfinder. So you can you get your little pictograms that are like, I'm at mountain focus. I'm at two people focus. I'm at flower focus. And that is like really helpful because you don't have to take your your eye away from it every single time you want to take a shot. Now that I say that, the Pentax 17 has that same feature. Yes. Yeah. So I guess the new Pentax 17 is a pretty decent zone focus. They're relying on you using zone focus pretty much. Yeah. And then the answer on the ISO, it depends on the camera's max shutter speed. If you're aiming for like f16, you know, you need to think sunny 16, what ISO, ISO 200 if it's sunny, if it's cloudy, then maybe ISO 400 and mm. same, so on and so forth. So depending on the camera specs, like I shoot a Leica and most of the times and max shutter speeds is 1, 1000. So F16 is 1, 6, 1 hundredth of its shutter speed and I always shoot like 1, 1000 F16 and have no issue. Mm. So like my ISO is 1600 film, I push two stops, I shoot like that, I can do F16, pretty much everything is in focus and I don't have to think about anything else but composition. Yeah, and then with a point and shoot, you're gonna be a little more limited than that. There aren't that many point and shoots and a lot of the zone focus cameras are sort of point and shoots that reach uh, even one one thousandth. So you might be yep. dealing with one five hundredth or one two fiftieth even. Um, and so you kind of have a max light that you can properly expose. Obviously on the other end, if it's too little light, you can always use a flash or something like that. Um, but yeah, if you have, if your aperture only goes to F16 like that, and your shutter only goes to 1 250th or 1 500th, you might have some exposure issues in very bright light. Um, if you're using ISO 400 or ISO 800 even more. Um, and then you'll want something that's 200 or 100, probably. Yeah. But yeah. Check the camera you choose and then you go with that. Then we have this other question, which I'm not going to read the name. Is the Canon Demi a good half-frame camera or is the Olympus Pen a better option? Um, the, there are many different Olympus Pens and I think they handle quite differently. There are some that are fully manual um, with no light meters at all. There are some that are like selenium cell programmed exposure and there are some that are sort of in between. They have a meter, but they also have manual functions. So I think in that sense, the pens are much more varied. So you can really sort of nail in exactly what features you want and don't want. Whereas the Demis, I think there's only like maybe three models and they all have similar-ish features. They have that aperture priority and, or I think they might just be full program. Maybe there's one that has I've never priority. used the Canon Demi. I would say the Olympus Pen, at least the OG F and the FD are pretty nice cameras because they're manual. And yeah. they have the light meter attachments and things like that. But like I've shot with the Pen F. They're kind of getting pricier, but they're very reliable. You're manual focusing and they, you can do mm -hmm. a lot of that. And the shutter speed. And I love that circular shutter like turret that it does yeah, um, i'd say and there's pen uh lens selection is great if you have the interchangeable lenses yeah, yeah you get different lenses it's i you would say the olympus too. pen is a much better camera in my opinion the pen f for sure yeah but there's plenty of pens there's pen d pen e yeah. pen f pen ft and then i guess i'm missing a bunch more yeah. but yeah i'd say olympus pen uh, in the half frame, I guess everybody's in half frame mode now with the Pentax 17. 17. We have the <laughs> EGW photo, inspiration for half frame composition. Um, I would say I've shot some half frame, not a lot, but I've always enjoyed half frame what is like medium to close up photography. Yeah. Like half frame as like landscape, well 35 as landscape to me has always been very hard to compose because like it's like the detail is not so good as when medium format, which nowadays is readily available, easy to shoot, so shooting a RB is great. But then I like like the medium to tight shots for composition in half frame. Yeah, I, I think I agree. And I think a lot of the lenses on half frame cameras tend to be a little bit longer than like a normal lens that you'd get for a full frame camera. Yeah, due to the crop, like, yeah. it's like a third, like, the pen F that we just talked about, I have the 38, which is the 38, 1, 8 is the standard lens that yeah. came with it. But it ends up, that, like the equivalent is like, like 40 something, something, 50 even. something, yeah. Um, so it is, it's very nice to shoot, and I've done projects where I've shot like four or five rolls of half frame in a day, 
and like getting to the closer details kind of is very fun. And then when you do the dip takes because you can scan them as two together, yeah. it yeah, opens the, the another creature. A nice like storytelling thing. Yeah. And I wonder if that's what they were talking about. Even contrast, like you can do contrast. Yeah. Like one can be like landscape, and the next one can be a close up, or one can be like a thing of trash, and the next one can be a flower. And you like make the mm -hmm. contrast and the compositions and stuff. So I think that's pretty fun. I would say check work of people online and see half frame composition. Some people do amazing things. Yeah, that's but some cool stuff. Like I'd say the two meters to like minimal focus are like where it gets really really fun. Mm. Like the flower mode on the Pentax 17 is just like yeah, fun. Yeah, it's, it's cool. And you do have to like, especially if you're looking at a diptych, like the subject can be really small if they're not big or close to you. So yeah, getting a subject that's close to you helps you be able to see it yep. on a negative or on a small print even. And you get 72 pictures per roll, so just have fun and experiment and see what works for you. We have the next question, mess with film. What do you think of a Fujika GM670 as a Mamiya 7 alternative? This was my first medium format camera for that exact reason. Um, it's heavy, is the biggest thing. It, it doesn't look maybe that heavy, but then if you, if you hold it, it's heavy. Uh, the GM670 is cool compared to some of the other Fuji rangefinders because it's interchangeable lenses. Um, so there's a bunch of different options there. They can be difficult to find aside from the normal lens, but it's there if you want it, if you want a wide angle or a telephoto or, yeah. Um, I'd say it's a great alternative. I've had the Mamiya 7, I have the G, uh, the Texas range, like uh, whatever, they're called GW690 and mm. GW680. Mm. I think if you, if you're looking for a Mamiya 7, this will do very well, unless you've shot the Mamiya 7. If you've yeah. shot the Mamiya 7, then it kind of ruins, it. It ruins all yeah. of it, because the micro contrast sharpness, whatever you want to call it, on the Mamiya 7 glass is it's, the it's, best. It's the next, it's next level. Uh, that, there's a reason it has a cult. Yeah. And then anything on behind it, like, and I currently have a Pablo Machina as my alternative to the Mamiya 7, and every time I look at the pictures, it's like, it looks great, but the Mamiya 7 would have looked... <laughs> greater, or at least on my taste, it would look better. But I decided to settle on a, a Pavel. But yeah, any of these rangefinder, medium format, 6.7, 6.8, 6.9s are really good alternatives. And like Connor said, the GM670 is just heavier because it has the interchangeable mounts. Well, and uh, it's a 6x9 camera. Yeah. Just scaled down. It yeah. just has different gearing on the inside. But the GW670, if you can find it, or the 680, 690 are surprisingly lightweight yeah, for what lighter. they are. They, they switched a lot to plastics. Yeah. So it's like bulky, but it's actually lightweight. Yeah. So the only thing I do notice on the 670, 680, 690 is the minimal focus distance is actually a little bit longer than I would like. Yeah, it's not so great. That was like, one of the things that made me want to switch to an SLR um, just to get a little bit closer and having more lens options. And also accurate focusing because yeah. you are like looking through the lens, which helps a lot. But yeah, and that's why I shoot an RB67 uh, is because I like 67, but I like composing exactly what's in the shot. But for the price, it's... It's a good, it's a good job. It's really good, yeah. Yeah, get yourself an external meter and shoot away. We have Ahmedi Nam, I'm probably butchering that. Thoughts on the Leica C3? We can put a picture of the Leica C3. Our editor, Tuomas, can put a picture of the Leica C3. Uh, it's like a very designy looking camera. I think it's very striking visually. Um, it's pretty. I think that the the specs of it are not incredibly impressive in my opinion. It's pretty normal point and shoot stuff. 28 to 80 lens. Yeah. I would say for the price point that they go for, it's not probably worth it. Um, yeah. But it is a bit of a cult in the aesthetics of it probably designed by well, who knows like i don't know the the reality porsche design or, or something like that it kind of has that aesthetic to it but for the price it goes for i would say there's better options i would say even better cooler. Leica options yeah probably even you can cooler. probably if you spend a little bit less you can get the Leica mini which is a um, sony a, i think it's a minolta i think it's, it's a minolta revo yeah. one of them is or you can spend a little bit more. We're looking at one now that's 600 US dollars. If you spend a little bit more, you can get a Minilux, which is highly recommended. A lot higher quality 
build yeah. quality than this. Yeah. Than the C3. This is like medium range Leica, which is like, like it's like a Mewtwo zoom or something like that. Yeah. I would say I wouldn't fully go for it unless you really like the Leica la, like name and the, uh, the so looks. There was the also camera. a little bit big compared to, again, if you compare it to a Mew, Mewtwo zoom, yes. it's way bigger. Yeah. So. Okay, we have another name I can't pronounce. Pentax 85 F1.8 SMC K or Auto Takumar. Uh, well, we're talking about two different Pentax portrait lenses, one for K mount and one for M42. Yeah. Um, so the K mount one is going to give you much more, much newer coatings. They're still quite old, but they're much newer. That those SMC coatings are some of the best that were made at that time and ever, really. Um, really good color rendition, really good micro contrast compared to a lot of the other stuff that was being made at the time. Um, a more modern body, so it's going to be, there might even be some plastic depending on the model you get. Uh, but the older one, the Auto Tacomar, is going to be all metal, um, all manual. Uh, older coatings, so it might be a little bit yellow, it might be a little bit softer clinically. Yeah, softer. I think if you're adapting to digital, I'd say Auto Takumar is great. If you're shooting on film, probably the SMC came out is better. Yeah. I find the older lenses to give me a little bit of a nicer feel on digital, as I find the more clinical, cleaner end of yeah. the film era to be really good for film. They have a lot of, it'll, it'll have a lot of character. And if that's what you're looking for, because yeah, you gave us two different mounts. So assumedly you're looking to adapt. Um, and in that sense, yeah, the older lenses will give you a lot of character. Yeah, I, I like the older for, if you're going for a digital sensor, go with the older. If you're going for film, go for the newer. Get one that's messed up. I, I buy the, <laughs> yeah, I actually buy a lot of the hazy R yeah. lenses from Leica. And I love how they look when I put them on a digital camera because I kind of don't like it, it rolls off the highlights in a very natural way. Yeah. As in, if I have my digital lenses, they just are very good at contrast and very good at like sharpness and yeah. very good at like it doesn't roll the off the quality same way. of the bouquet. And so, like, the flaw is actually something I'm happy yeah, to well, see. That's why everyone loves those Helios lenses. I yeah. mean, the, the things that we now describe as character are really just optical flaws for the most part. Yeah that give lenses unique looks that we have lost a bit coming to the modern age. Yeah, we go for that's perfection and then we we mess it up on filters. That's how they do it nowadays. Okay, we have uh, in Tania Pedia. Tania is my sister's name. Um, are there Maybe any... It's her. Huh? Maybe it's her. Maybe it's her. Are there any benefits to all at all to rangefinder cameras over, for example, SLRs? Yes. Next. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> there are still advantages, I think, to rangefinders over SLRs, even today. Um, obviously, SLRs, I think, give you a lot more versatility in general with um, lots of accessories you can add. Back in the day, they took over with different focusing screens and prisms and a lot more lenses. Uh, SLRs are better with telephoto and ultra-wide lenses, really. Mm -hmm. But rangefinders are generally smaller. They're generally quieter. And with a rangefinder, you're able to see very uniquely outside of the field that you're looking. So if you're sort of holding on one frame, especially in street photography, um, you can see people coming or objects coming or whatever before they're in frame, which gives you time to sort of get the composition right. Whereas with an SLR, you only see what the lens sees. So. Yeah, I I I'm I use rangefinders all the time. I would never been able to open both eyes. I could, just can't do it. Mm. I'd say one thing that I like about rangefinders, the viewfinder kind of always is focused, so you're not distracted by the bokeh and the separation, which is obviously an artistic choice if you want to have bokeh and if you want to have separation. And it's nice to see SLRs, but like I like the idea when I'm shooting rangefinder that I'm thinking only composition wise because mm. everything is kind of focused. So. If I am shooting, like we talked in the zone focus, like F11, F16, I'm not looking for separation between a subject and the wall or subject and the landscape. I'm just kind of like including what do I want in my image. And I think Rangefinders does a good job at yeah. like, it's so perfectly sharp at all corners you look at that you then start looking at like, do I want that cable here? Do I want that light or lamppost? 
So it helps in that composition. Obviously, rangefinders you're not seeing through the lens, so you've got to take that with a pinch of salt. If you are really focusing on composition, then you want an SLR and you want 100% viewfinder coverage, which not every SLR has it. But yeah, I, they're there. Then we have Arcadio Morelga. Um, does the camera restored by you benefit from full CLA? Let's so start defining CLA. Yeah, for the un uninitiated, CLA stands for cleaning, lubrication, and adjustment. Um, so in a sense, yes, um, when we restore an item, we will say very explicitly what has been done to it. Um, often that doesn't mean we're taking everything down completely apart to the screws and cleaning every single screw, because that is largely unnecessary for pretty much anything. Um, and is just uh, not wasteful, but uh, inefficient with our time. We have very few mechanics and very many cameras to fix. So we're fixing um, things sort of, we would say, as necessary. Um, and it says that on the website that like, if we did this RB, for example, we would say that the, the shutter mechanisms in here were cleaned, lubricated, and adjusted as necessary. It's sort of like if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. We will lubricate things as just preventative maintenance. Um, but a lot of mechanisms in some cameras don't need to be fixed. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. with a full CLA, is, like Connor said, it's the places that you know have wear and tear you yeah. need to lubricate. Most mechanical cameras that were made to be CLA'd have like very specific places you're supposed to open and mm. clean them, lubricate them, and adjust them. And that's where our mechanics we, do. We, we hit those. Yeah. If there's like a place that, you know, like some things, we have spare parts. We were just in a meeting the other day about spare parts and like parts we should make. Some parts never, ever get broken. So I don't need to na change the nameplate on a Leica. I might need to change, you know, the advanced lever, and those always will break. So we know which parts to do when we touch them. Obviously, full CLA is what we include in restored items. That's the whole point of it. But if something is completely working fine, then we don't say it's restored. We just say it's, uh, yeah. you know, what is our standard not passed? What's the other certified. one? Certified. Sorry. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we will say certified. If we test this camera and it's perfectly well, and sometimes we sell a camera, someone sells it back to us, and we won't say it's CLA'd from us or restored. We just say like, hey, it's certified because we did this CLA like a year ago. So we consider that it's yeah. still within the time yeah. span of uh, the lifespan of a CLA. So that is like that. So we do do CLA if it says restored. But yeah. yeah. Next question, fuzzy juice. What camera system comes in that hardly ever needs repair? Always seems to work. Well, we decided that pinhole cameras are probably the best bet. Um, after nothing that, can go wrong in there. Not much can go wrong in a pinhole. Yeah. The second is probably digital gear. Usually is in good working order due to age. But even that, though, a lot of, like, if it's, if, it, yeah. if it's a heavily used digital camera, we pretty much always have to clean the sensor. And no, we, sensor we pretty cleaning, much always yes. do. But that's some kind of repair. Yeah, I mean, is. we can't just flip it. Um, but yeah, the, the reality is that a lot of these older mechanical cameras that are 50, 60 years old, even if they seem to work, or they, whatever, the auditory testing where it, it fires and all the mechanisms sound snappy and sharp, a lot of the time they're not working within what we consider our tolerances, so. And you can feel like our mechanics are usually the ones that test the high end, which is the ones that are made to be repaired. Yeah. They can feel if they're dry, if they're like, because one thing is you have a, imagine an RB67 and you're shooting it and you're every day and like, you know, you're like, I'm going to sell it. And someone picks it up and they're like, oh, this feels dry. You're like, well, it feels fine to me. But if you've touched 20 in the past week, yeah. you like, uh, you create a habit of noticing mm -hmm. these things. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a car mechanic can turn on a car and immediately be like, oh, that sounds like the alternator's about to go. Yeah. This is a similar situation when we, we pick up a camera that is a you know mechanical camera the mechanics are doing every day they they get a sense of what is needed and they will probably like it is working now but will benefit from a full CLA yeah. which goes with the question we had previously yes so 
many times we will offer a price that is not like ready to be listed because we decide that the camera will do better. And then we're trying to ensure that the gear that is in the market is limited. So if we do create that CLA on it, it will come back in 10 years maybe to us and it only needs another CLA. As in, if we were like, it kind of works, we sell it. Obviously, we can probably pay a little bit more to the customer. We can save some money on mechanics. But then in two years, maybe it snaps a gear, it snaps a, like anything, and there's no spares. Then that's a donor body, no longer a working camera. Yeah. So it's a, it's a complicated context because we do have a lot of repairs. And it's just not easy. But cameras that hardly ever need repair, pretty much none, and then if they don't need repair, they probably could do with a little bit of love. Yeah. And there's some cameras that were not made to be repaired, like point and shoots are known oh, to not be made to be like open and change gears. They're all plastic. Yeah. It's, it's, not all, great. it's all PCBs on a lot of them. So like, yeah, circuit boards that, you know, even if you know how to solder, it, they're made in a factory by a laser cutter machine that, that works at a scale that humans can't. Yeah, <laughs> but like if you if your gear has been maintained properly or professionally, mm. usually high end gear doesn't need a lot of like repair. So I could say yeah. Mamiya RBs, if they were in studios and they were shot and they were maintained, those hardly need repairs. But mm. we will do that CLA, as in some other brands like will have more issues commonly. Like some that are very common is Bronicas are really complex to fix and do have quite a lot of issues. Yeah. The Roliflex SL66 is like a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Every time one comes in, it's like, please don't bring it in. Like, we won't take it. They always have something wrong. Right. So there's more that are very wrong than more than are yeah. always very yeah. right. I think you can tell if you browse our site enough the way that maybe we do. <laughs> um, if you start to see trends of, of higher end cameras that are on the site with a lot of issues still, those are probably the ones that our mechanics have either have never tried to repair because maybe they're too complicated or we don't have proper documentation or we've tried and decided that, that this there's not enough spare parts or it takes three weeks to properly repair a Rolay SL66 or whatever um, and it's just not worth it so yep okay let's go to the last question from Samuel Mail 2 Nikon FM2 versus Nikon F Three, I mean, these three questions, the CLA, which cameras come to need repair and which ones don't, and now this question kind of can tie together. FM2 is a mechanical camera. F3 is not a mechanical camera. So if I had to choose, like I've actually been thinking about this because I got glasses recently and rangefinders are not simple to use with glasses, mm. is maybe I want to start shooting more like SLRs because a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, FM2 would probably be my choice for a camera, that or an F2. I think an Icon F2 or an FM2 would be my choice. The F3 is a professional line instead of the FM2, which is not so much the professional, it was like the prosumer model, but the F3 does have electronics, so failure yeah. can be there, LCD screens, little thingies mm -hmm. here and there. Mm -hmm. So I would go for an FM2. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about the here and now use of it, then it's more of a subjective thing. But yeah, the long term, maybe the five year, 10 year forecast for these things is that eventually there won't be new parts for an Icon F3 and lubricating it and cleaning things won't be enough to fix it. But with an FM2, if you properly maintain it, theoretically speaking, the mechanical parts of it will work indefinitely. And it has a one four thousand of a shutter speed on mechanical cameras, like a like Leica yeah. has one 1,000. It's like two extra stops there that you can, you know, freeze action, shoot wide open. I, I think the FM2 is a no-brainer. I've used a few times, and I love it. I've used the F3 a few times. And then the body weight, the F3 had a space and a time for the professionals in the day. Nowadays, you're not shooting unless you're an uh, expired club guy that's shooting soccer with an F3. You're just shooting normal photos of your friends, family, you know, holidays, FM2 is plenty good. F3 yeah. is like a beast. Yeah, the benefits you get from that professional system, like the, the things we mentioned earlier, the wide array of motor winders and, and focusing screens and um, uh, prisms, you don't, the benefit of that is kind of very niche. 
Um, I would say the only thing with the F3 is that it has aperture priority, auto exposure. But there's plenty of other SLRs that do that. So. Get an F80, man. It's it's the yeah, well, yeah. tenth of the price, yeah. and it's a great camera. I, I'd say if you're going for an F3, F100 is a great option as a more modern alternative, or F80, because it mm -hmm. does, like, the F3 is like the Pro Pro, F100 was like the, the just under the Pro Pro second body, maybe for professionals. It's like a mini F6, and then the F80 is like 90% of what the F100 uh, is. Yeah. And nowadays, the features that it had, the F100 versus F80, were like necessary in the 80s, well, 90s, end of the 90s. It was, I think, 2000 when it came out, the F80. It's just perfect. Like, it has everything you could think of. Mm. Or if you don't want to go with Nikon, Canon 300B is like affordable, plenty full, whatever breaks, get another one, versus like, you could say, like, I can't want a Canon 1V. It's like, yeah, but the 1V is made for. Yeah. You know, the Olympics, and this one's fine for shooting normal stuff. I think the internet would agree with you. Watching the prices on the FM2s go up and up and up, and the F3s have really kind of stayed similar-ish over the past few years. So, Yep. Both are great. The FM2 maybe is a better choice in the long run. Yep. They're, and they're pretty cameras. I mean, they actually, even if aesthetics is a thing you choose, which people shooting film nowadays choose that as a thing. Yeah, for sure. FM2 looks nicer more classic than an f3 even though i do like the design of the f3 the classic like you know if you think of a film camera an fm2 looks more like it I the f3 so. is like it is, it is very camera. like yeah like this is exactly what it, like if i were to draw a film slr from memory it's like it would look like the fm or fm2 yeah yeah yep. but yeah that's all the questions we have for this week. These, like Connor mentioned, we post it on social media, usually Instagram. People ask us anything about the store, the cameras that we touch, we check, we clean, we price, we buy. Ask us anything and we'll be happy to answer as best we can. Yeah, because we only do specific things. I mean, we're not fixing cameras or even cleaning them that often. Nope. Um, but yeah. Thank you so much for submitting your questions and spending your time watching the video. Uh, I've been Connor, joined as usual by Nico, and we will see you in the next video.